Now, as promised, guys, I want you to come and do some ghost story scenes. It is the month of October, and within the month of October, we have Halloween. This first ghost story I'm going to tell you about is all about the ghost of Lady Hobie of Bisham Abbey. Sitting peacefully on the banks of the Thames near Maidenhead is Bisham Abbey, said to be the most haunted house in Berkshire. Unlike many other mansions with similar titles, Bisham is wholly haunted by one ghost. She just appears rather a lot. And her story, a tale of pride and selfishness, is a lesson to us all. When the black monks of Bisham were forcibly evicted from their beautiful abbey on the banks of the River Thames in 1538, they did not go quietly. On the contrary, Henry the Hates Commissioners had to drag the abbot kicking and screaming from the steps of the eye halter. He could not bear to see East Abbey fall into secular hands. As he was bundled into the cart that was waiting to take him away, he turned and he cursed the Abbey. As God is my witness, this property shall never be inherited by two direct successors, for its sons will be hounded by misfortune. Misfortune has indeed struck the sons of Bisham's owners, the Hobbies, and lately the Fasatons, with alarming regularity. The first instance of a sudden death in the family of the Lord of the Manor is, however, by far most disturbing. This is the tale of poor little William Hobie. The boy William was the youngest son of Sir Thomas and Lady Elizabeth Hobie. Like his brothers and sisters before him, he was brought up at Bisham Abbey under the watchful eye of his mother. Sir Thomas having died when his children were very small. Lady Hobie was a personal friend of Queen Elizabeth I. She was very proud and ambitious. Some might even say that she was quite cold and hard. Being one of the most learned ladies of her age, Lady Holby was eager to ensure that her children received the same rigorous education that both she and her husband had. She therefore oversaw all the children's tuition herself, going so far as to actually teach them certain subjects, such as Greek and Latin. Dame Holby expected perfection from her pupils and wielded a heavy ruler to make sure she got it. Poor William was not as bright as his siblings. He constantly stumbled over his lessons and blotted his copybooks, and his mother's quick temper was often lost. In her eyes, he was nothing but a lazy good for nothing. A summer house had been constructed for the children on the edge of the lawn down by the river, where many of their classes were taken on sunny days. The villagers on the towpath opposite were always able to see the youngsters scribbling away, while Lady Holby walked sternly between them, watching over every letter. One gossip even related over a pint of beer, how he had once heard violent shouts coming from the bower. On investigation, he clearly saw her ladyship beating little William about the head with a ruler, until he collapsed and fell to the ground. Blood streamed from his eyes, nose, and mouth and saturated the grass. Sadly, this was to be William Hobie's lot in life. He was always slow and clumsy and could never live up to his mother's expectations. It was even rumoured amongst some of the locals that the little boy had some sort of brain tumour. One day, when it was too cold for the lessons in the summer house to take place, Elizabeth took her children up to the warmth of the Abbey's tower room. For the older children, the class passed quickly and they were soon sent off to play. But poor William had got behind in his work and he had to stay to finish it. Lady Hobie was already annoyed by her son's stupidity, but then, splat, splat. William had pressed too hard on his quill again. The ink surged from the pen and spread over the page in front of him. To Lady Hobie, the blot's personal guide, all that was wrong with the world. The ruler rose high in the air and came down like a rocket. Crack 
on the little boy's head. William wailed in pain as he fell to the floor. Again and again his mother hit him till the blood ran once more. Eventually she stopped, but her hands were covered with gore and her anger had not yet been fully vented. Fetching some rope, she dragged poor William back up into his chair and there she tied him to the chair by his waist and legs. Finally, she thrust the quill back into his hand and the copybook into his face. You will rewrite every word of today's lesson and it had better be perfect in every way or you know what will happen. Then she spun out of the room with a flurry, slam went the door and click went the key in the lock. Still fired up by the morning's events, Lady Hobie had a horse straddled and off she thundered into the woods. The chase would vent her fury, but soon after she left, a messenger arrived at the Abbey with a letter from the Queen. It was said to be urgent, so a page rolled out to deliver it to her personally. Her ladyship was puzzled to see one of the servants ride up beside her, but her confusion soon turned to joy after she read the royal message. She had been summoned to court by Queen Elizabeth and was ordered to leave without delay. Come, she said to the young page, we must go at once. And so they rode off to Windsor Castle without a thought for packing or saying goodbye to anyone. Lady Hobie refelled in court life. The banquets, the balls, the handsome young men. She flirted, she enjoyed the flattery, the compliments and also the gossip. And of course, the envious eyes that poured over her friendship with the Queen. So, as you can imagine, it was several before she felt like, oops, I guess I better return back home to my children. If this servant had thought William was with her, then she jumped down from her horse, raced up to the tower room. But of course, it was far too late. Little William was dead. She was so filled with remorse for her wicked actions. If only she hadn't have been so selfish, so violent, she would still be alive. And she spent the rest of her life in sorrowful misery. Shortly after her death, in 1609, it is said that her ghost returned and was seen wandering around the house. And since then she has been seen many times. A miraculous fountain floats before her and she constantly tries to wash blood from her hands. She's also been known for her appearances in the tower room where poor little William died, usually around the time of a coronation, where she shows her guilt for choosing her monarch over her son. And that concludes the first of my ghost stories, Fell of His Mouth. Hope you enjoyed it. As per usual, if you did, let me know by giving the video a thumbs up. Uh, if you'd like to leave a comment, please do so. And I will be back soon with another ghost story. Until then, bye for now.